Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. So let's go to the Lord. Father, we are so grateful for this history, this information that you give us that sometimes to us seems like minutia because it's details and names that we don't know and don't mean anything to us, but they're important to you. You put them in your word to have an exact record of the people and the places in order to have a perfect lineage of the Messiah from Abraham all the way up to Jesus. Let us see everything in your word as, and understand that it has a purpose and a meaning for each one of us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go back and review a little bit about what we've seen in the book of Genesis. It's an amazing book. Did you know that Genesis is actually considered history? A matter of fact, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, are considered history, law and history. And it clearly is history because it gives us the story of creation. It tells us about sin, how sin entered the world, which leads us to understand the need for a savior. And of course, we know about the flood we know about the generations over and over again, the generations of Noah and the generations of Adam and the generations of Seth. And tonight we're going to see the generations of Ishmael and Isaac. And then very important is the establishment and the covenants God gave to the Hebrew nation. They weren't called Jews for a long time. Does anybody know when they were first called Jews and why? The first time was when they were, went to Babylon. And the people who went to Babylon primarily were from Judah. So they started calling them Jews in Babylon. And we've called them Jews ever since from the lineage of Judah. Now, as we move into today's lesson, we're going to study a lot. I mean, I've, I've, I've got eight pages here and I put six on a page. So I hope you guys didn't do individual pages. But there's a lot. That we're talking about this generational shift. We're going to see the death of one generation and the beginning of a next generation, passing on the lineage and the covenants that God promised to Abraham. So we begin in Genesis 23, verses 1 through 4. that say, Now Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Now, uh, as we look at Hebron, Hebron is where the oaks of Mamre were. Oh, the oaks of Mamre is where Abraham settled often and spent a lot of time there. So we can recognize that as Hebron. It's about uh, an hour drive south of Jerusalem. So it's in the southern part of Israel today. Still there, still the city of Hebron. It is controlled by the Palestinians primarily. And that is because Israel has given self-government to several of the cities in the West Bank. And that is one of them. It is in the, what's considered the West Bank, but it's biblical Judah. Verse 3 says, Then Abraham arose from before, from before his dead and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I'm a stranger and a sojourner among you. Give me a burial site among you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Now, when he says, give me, is he looking for them to give him a gift? No, actually what he's saying is, I want to buy it. When he says, give it to me, sell it to me is what he's saying. So it goes on to say in the next passage in verses five to eight, the sons of Heth answered Abraham saying to him, hear us, my Lord, you are a mighty prince. Now, that's quite something. This is a sojourner in their land, and they're seeing something very unique in Abraham. Do people see something unique in us, in our lives, in the way we live? They can only see that if we live with integrity and follow our one true God. We had a person, two couple, a couple, sit with us up on the area of Pegasus in Athens on Mars Hill, when I was teaching there afterwards, I said, uh, I said, I asked them, I said, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, um, 
I don't remember what I said after that, but they said, this was very interesting. You've given us something to think about. And, and that was fascinating to me because they just sat down and they obviously hadn't heard this because we gave them something to think about. So we made an impact. Our group made an impact one way or another on this couple. And so I keep praying for them that it was a positive impact, just like Abraham had with the people, the pagans that he lived among. So going back to verse 6 again, it says, Hear us, my Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our graves. None of us will refuse you his grave for burying your dead. Why would they make such an offer to him? I mean, this is real estate. This is land that they owned. Well, consider that. We're going to answer that in a minute. So Abraham rose and bowed to the people of the land, the sons of Heth. And he spoke with them, saying, If it is your wish for me to bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and approach Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me. He had a particular cave in mind that was owned by Ephron. So the question is, who are the sons of Heth? Because it had said earlier that the people of the land were the sons of Heth. Well, if we go back to Genesis 10, 15, we find that Heth was a son of Canaan. We know that the land that Israel entered was the land of Canaan, at least after Moses' time, after the Exodus. We know that there are many Canaanites. I didn't put that whole passage of Genesis 10 here because we've read it before. But it tells us that Seth was the, son, the second son of Canaan, and then Canaan had many other sons, and they were all called Ites. I mean, after their name, it all it mentions ites after each one of them. So we, I call that land the land of the ites because it's not just the Canaanites, but it's Cain's descendants, which are the other ites that all lived in the land that would become known as Israel. Now the Hittites, which is who the Seth was a, I mean, Heth was a son of Canaan, but he was also a Hittite. They were known, they were called, the Hittites in the mountains of Hatti were known as the sons of Heth. The great Hittite empire, which there once was, was centered in Turkey, in Anatolia, in Turkey. But they had colonies in various places, including here in the Canaanite region. So Ephraim, who owned the cave of Machpelah, was a Hittite and a son of Heth. Just a little history to show you that God has a reason for putting all of that in there. He wanted us to know how powerful the Hittites were and how powerful these sons of Heth were also. It says in Genesis 23, 9-12, uh, going, actually going back, it says, um, I'm going back to the previous place, where Abraham said, Approach Ephron the son of Zophar for me, and now it says that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns, which is at the center of the field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence for a burial site. That shows us that he wasn't asking for it for free, even though they were offering him all kinds of burial sites. Now Ephron was sitting among the sons of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the sons of Heth, even of all who went in at the gate of the city. Now, what does it mean being at the gate of the city? That's where the business was conducted, and that's where they were. So Ephron said, No, my lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that's in it. In the presence of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Abraham bowed before the people of the land. Now, that sounds like a really generous thing to do. But you've got to know the history of that kind of a recommendation or that kind of an attitude. First of all, they had all this land and they weren't using most of it probably, especially if it was a cave because you, you could only use caves for hiding your sheep. You can't use them really for much of anything else. But if Ephron gave Abraham that cave and that land, that would make Abraham a vassal of Ephron. In other words, he would have to pay homage to Ephron. He would have to provide him whatever he produced in that area as a 
yearly tax, you might say, because he was a vassal. He would be an, a vassal of Ephron. Is that something Abraham would want to do? No. God promised him that land. The last thing he wants to do is be responsible to somebody else to have a piece of land. That gives you an idea of how the Jews should not have put themselves in the situation they're in today because they are, it is God's land that God has given to them and yet now they have given up a lot of that land and to get it back is going to be impossible until Jesus returns. So anyway, un, um, Abraham understood that. He understood the, what would happen if he accepted a gift. Therefore, he wanted to pay for it. Ephron's no dummy. It says in verses 13 to 16, he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, if you will only please listen to me, I will give you the price of the field, accept it from me that I may bury my dead. Then Ephraim answered Abraham, saying to him, My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? <laughs> I read that and I think, was it really worth 400 pieces of silver? I mean, he said, you can have the land, and then he throws out a price. So Abraham said, My Lord, or Ephraim said, My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you, me and you? So bury your dead. Abram listened to Ephron, and Abram weighed out for Ephron the silver which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, commercial standard. No bargaining, no uh, saying, wow, that's way overpriced. He paid the full asking price because Abraham want, was, he did not want to be a vassal of anyone. He wanted to be free, and therefore he paid f for the price. Now, 400 shekels. A shekel is, was worth four ounces. So if you counted that up, 1,600 ounces, 1,600 ounces of silver today at today's price is worth $42,096. That's not much compared to today's prices for a piece of land. However, we don't know how big the cave was or how much land it was or what it was, if it had any value. If you noticed going back, it had trees in a cave which don't have the value of farmland. So he paid a premium price. The key here is, this is land that Abraham bought in modern day Israel. First time we see Jewish land purchased by anyone in that land. So legally, we have a legal document right here. We have proof that that land, that at least the cave of Machpelah, belongs to the Jews. And yet right now, the Palestinians are controlling that city. The Palestinians are controlling that cave area. And they won't let Jews in there very often or Christians. There's another time when somebody purchased land in Israel. Does anybody know when that was? Excellent, excellent. In 2 Samuel, the last chapter in 2 Samuel, I think it's 24, but whatever it is, David bought the threshing floor of Aruna. Because, long story, because God stopped a plague. He prayed and God stopped a plague right there at the threshing floor of Aruna. So he purchased that threshing floor, offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and the Lord stopped the plague. The threshing floor of Aruna and mentioned in Chronicles, is actually where the Temple Mount is today. And David purchased that. Again, we have biblical proof of these two purchases, and both of them are controlled by Muslims right now. Now, in our modern-day times, we don't have a legal deed, but in certainly from the Bible, we do. So Ephraim's field, which was in Machpelah, which faced Mamre. Remember, that's where Abraham spent a lot of his time, was in Mamre, right there in Hebron. The field and cave which was in it, and all the trees which were in the field that were within the confines of the border, were deeded over to Abraham for possession in the presence of the sons of Heth, before all who went in the gate of the city. So they handled a legal transaction right there, just as we have read how they did it. 
After this, Abraham buried Sarah's wife in the cave of the field of Machpelah facing Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded over to Abraham for a burial site from, by the sons of Heth. There's 20 verses telling us kind of the same thing over and over again. But God wants us to know that Abraham was a man of integrity. He didn't just accept free land. He didn't become a vassal of anyone. He paid for it outright. There was proof because of the people at the gate and because of the transfer of money. This would become the cave for Sarah. Eventually, it would become the cave of the patriarchs. There you have a couple of pictures of what that looks like today. Over the years, they built a church over that site, over the cave. You go down below, and there's several caves down below. And then when the Muslims took over, they built a mosque. They changed the churches into a mosque. So you get an idea of what it looks like as you're walking up to it, and then what it looks like from an overview from the top. It is still there today. We were supposed to go there on our last trip to Israel, but there were <laughs> major issues with the Palestinians that day, so we couldn't go. I've never been there because Hebron is not conducive to tourists. Uh, it's in the West Bank, and there's a lot of Palestinian violence in that city. But sometimes, sometimes you can go in there. What, the question is, was Ephron trying to trick Abraham? Uh, no, it was a matter of business back then. He wasn't trying to trick him as much as he was just willing to sell him the land so this guy would be accountable to him. Remember, Abraham was seen as a mighty prince and to have the mighty prince under your authority would be a, would put a feather in Ephron's cap so he wasn't trying to trick Abraham as much as he was trying to uh, gain respect by having him under his authority Abraham would have been wise enough to know how they dealt with matters in those days and that's why he wanted to pay for the cave instead of accept it and it's, again, the same thing with David buying the threshing floor of Aruna. He would not want to be considered a vassal or that land a vassal to Aruna or anyone else. He wanted to pay for it. We, on the other hand, if somebody offered it to us, we'd take it. But it was a different time back then than it is now. In, now we're moving to Genesis chapter 24. And here it tells us, now Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. How old was Abraham at this point? Well, let's go, if we go back to when Sarah died, she died at age 127. Abraham was 10 years older than her, so he was at least 137 at this time. At least, maybe more. So Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had ch charge of all the things he owned. Let me stop there. What was his name? What was the name of Abraham's oldest servant who had charge of all of his affairs? Does anybody know? He just read it in the footnotes. Eliezer was the person. And we read that in Genesis 15. When God promised Abraham all these descendants, Abraham said, but I have no descendants of my own flesh. The, the one who is in charge of my household, Eliezer, will be my heir. And God said, no, you're going to have a son. So that's how we find out about Eliezer is from Genesis 15 too. He was a trusted employee. Employee isn't the right word. He was a servant, and yet he was treated with great respect. Now put yourself in Eliezer's shoes. In Eliezer's shoes, he was, up until Abraham was 100, he, or close to 100, he was the heir of Abraham's, everything Abraham had. And all of a sudden, Ishmael was born. And then Ishmael was sent away after Isaac was born. So now Eliezer has lost all of his inheritance that he was going to have. And yet he is still a faithful servant. He said, uh, he said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, that's a person he respected, Abraham respected. And he said to them, please place your hand under my thigh. 
That's an interesting thing. And I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you should not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I live, but you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. He's giving his servant a responsibility here. And how does he codify this responsibility? How does he make Eliezer swear that he will do this? <laughs> By putting his hand under his thigh. Now we, I swear to God, I'm going to do this. Or we put our hand on the Bible and say, I swear to God. You know, we do things like that. But we don't put a hand under a thigh. Why would you put a hand under a man's thigh? Well, what's under a man's thigh? It's his loins. And his loins represent the seed of the man. And that's the most important thing that a man has, is his seed. So that is one of a couple of things. One is it's an oath that is swearing by the importance of Abraham. Everything that's important to Abraham, he's swearing by that. And it also could mean, if you recall, what is the sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham? Circumcision. So by putting the hand underneath that vital part of the man of Abraham, he's also swearing by the covenant that God made to Abraham which is descendants, which comes from the seed, which comes from his loins. So it's a unique way of making an oath. But you talk about a binding oath. Today we might shake hands or we might even sign a document. Actually, in James we're told, let your yes be yes and your no be no. We're not even supposed to make oaths. But this oath was so important. That's literally how they did it in Hebrew times was to show the importance of the oath. Why was this oath so important? First of all, what was the oath? All right, that he would make sure that his son didn't marry a Canaanite, but someone from his own family. That was the oath. Why is that so important that the servant would put his hand under Abraham's thigh for that significant oath? That's right, the Canaanites were the well, bad seed is what she said, but the wrong seed. They were not the right seed for the lineage of the Messiah. And the descendants were promised through Isaac. Abraham wanted to make sure it was a pure lineage. Now, it would get defiled over the years when you have uh, Ruth, who is a Moabitess that came into the lineage, and you had the harlot from Jericho, Rahab, who also came into the lineage. But God's God. He can make exceptions anytime he wants to. In this case, Abraham wanted to make sure that his servant understood the importance that Isaac's wife be from his family, not from the Canaanites. And he did that by putting his hand under his thigh and swearing. Now, we live in a generation where our word is no longer our bond. People say things all the time. Businesses say and promise things and never follow through with them. That's not the way it was when I grew up. That's not the way it has been in the past. That certainly wasn't the way it was at Abraham's time. This servant, to him, he would die if he did not fulfill this service to his master. It tells us in Genesis 24, 5 to 7 now, the servant said to him, suppose the woman is not willing to follow me to this land. Should I take your son back to the land from where you came? Then Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. Remember in Genesis 12, God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he gave them the land known as Canaan back then that would become Israel. Abraham did not want him to go back to his homeland because that's not the promise that God made to him. He, did not, he was not willing to compromise a wife for Isaac by going back to that land. In verse 7, The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your descendants I will give this land. 
He will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife for my son from there. Wow, so he reiterates in this passage that God made a covenant with him for this land. Therefore, Isaac is not to go back to his old home, Abraham's old homeland. And then what do you see about Abraham's attitude in this last verse? The verse says, he says to Eliezer, he will send his angel before you and you will take a wife for my son from there. What does that show you about Abraham? Trust. He trusted God. He knew. Now, did God tell him? We don't know. But God told him that, Abra that Isaac was his descendant, that Isaac would inherit the land, that Isaac, through Isaac, the Messiah would come. He told him all that. Abraham trusted God in that. So he knew God would somehow take care of Eliezer to make sure he got the wife and brought her back. He knew because he trusted God's word. Do we trust God's word like that? When God gives us a word from his word, do we believe it? Do we follow it like Abraham did? I mean, Eliezer was certainly concerned that this might not work out, but Abraham wasn't. He knew it would because he trusted God. Do you trust God? That's the question. And it's easy to say, oh, yeah, I trust God. But when you get in a circumstance that's difficult, do you trust God? I think I shared with you not long ago. Actually, I've been gone so long, I can't remember if it was you or the Tuesday class. Anyway, at a particularly difficult time in my life, I found this verse that says, uh, trust in the Lord. Um, oh, goodness, I can't even recite it. Um, let me find it here because it's so important about trusting in God for everything. It, uh, whatever the verse is and wherever it is, it does say, trust in the Lord and, and let your trust be in the Lord. So you trust with the Lord with your head, but you also let your heart and your soul trust in the Lord. Even when you don't know the outcome, even when you don't know what's going to happen. Trusting in the Lord is the most important thing we can do because God is trustworthy. And at some point, I'll find that verse and share it with you, but I can't find it right now. So we see that example of Abraham. It turns out in Genesis 24, 8 through 10, that Eliezer said, but if the woman, or Abraham said, if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from my oath only do not take my son back there. So he gave Eliezer a caveat. If it doesn't work out, you are free. That oath that you made that is binding for life, you are now free from if it doesn't work out. But again, Eliezer is his trusted servant. He's going to do everything he can to follow what Abraham has instructed him to do. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him, concerning this matter. Then the servant took 10 camels from the camels of his master and set out with a variety of good things of his master in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. That's back to Abraham's old stopping grounds. 10 camels. That's a lot of camels. And camels can hold a lot of stuff. That tells you he was taking a lot. Now understand he's He's traveling 450 miles. I don't know how many miles they could travel a day in a camel, but this is going to take a long time, and they need a lot of food along the way because they're traveling in the desert area. Well, they're traveling the Fertile Crescent, but it's still in desert-type areas. I'm going back to Genesis 11 now as a reminder of the genealogy as to why Abraham is sending him back to where he came from and what the genealogy and the relationships are going to be. So this is in Genesis 11. It says, now these are the records of the generation of Terah. Terah became the father of three sons, Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Haran became the father of Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldees. So Abram has one brother now, 
and that brother is Nahor. Abraham and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcal, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcal and Ishka. So what you have here, if you look at it closely, is you have Abraham marrying Sarah. We know later or earlier that we've studied that Sarah was considered, how is she related to Abraham? A half-sister. And now we see that um, Nahor's wife, Abraham's brother's wife, was Milcal, and she was the daughter of Abraham's brother. So technically, she was Nahor's niece, and they married, and they became husband and wife. We don't do that anymore because of genealogy and the destruction of that genealogy among our siblings if we were to do that. But they did back then. It wasn't corrupt like it is today. They not only did it back then, but that was the way to keep the lineage pure. My only thought is, Ugh, marrying my uncle? You know, that's not really interesting to me, but things were different back then. As we're going to see, Rebecca never even saw her husband until they've consummated their marriage, and nor he her. Uh, you know, things were different back then. Interesting, he said that he did a lot of research into the Septuagint and the Masoretic text, is that it? And uh, it says that Sarah was Abraham's niece. Very possible. I mean, we know they were related. That's the important thing. They kept the bloodline in their family. So this was not unusual to marry within the family. They did that all the time. So it's not unusual for Abraham to send Eliezer back to his hometown so that Isaac could marry a cousin. That's not unusual. I love my cousin, but I couldn't imagine marrying him. But then it's a different world. Genesis 10, 31, again going back, to, we've got to understand this. Terah took Abraham his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's, Abraham's wife, and they went out together from Ur the Chaldees in order to enter the land of Canaan. They went as far as Haran and settled there. I show you that scripture to show you that Abraham went and, um, and, and he went with Lot, his nephew, and their families, but Nahor didn't go. When Abraham came with his father to Canaan, Nahor stayed back in Mesopotamia in Ur of the Chaldees. That's the only family Abraham has left, so he's sending Eliezer back there. That's why Eliezer is going back to what they say is Nahor, but it's the city of Nahor. Now here's a map of Ur the Chaldees, and the, actually Mesopotamia. This is where Abraham and his Eliezer are. He has to travel all the way up there, the Fertile Crescent. This is where Ur of the Chaldees is. So he's got a long way to go. We've seen that map before. It is the direction from where Abraham came. And now Eliezer is going back. In Genesis 24, 11 through 13, we're told that Eliezer made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. And he says he made a prayer. Now, as I'm reading this, I think, what a great impression Abraham had on this servant, that he himself must have known the Lord and knew to pray and knew to pray to, the, to God. He followed Abraham's instructions. Abraham had trusted God. And now Eliezer finds himself in a spot where he needs to trust God. So his prayer is, O oh Lord. Now right there we see a relationship that he has with God by calling him Lord. The God of my master Abraham, please grant, grant me success today and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. I read that, I think that's what a true servant is. Somebody who's looking out for the best of their master more than themselves. Now he's asking for success in his venture, but not for himself, for his master. When we work in a business, we should want the best for our bosses. 
the best for our businesses. That doesn't mean we like them. It doesn't even mean we respect them. But we have a responsibility as children of God to honor those who are in authority over us. Eliezer is doing that. Remember, Eliezer lost all of his inheritance, and yet he still honors Abraham. Tells me what kind of a man Abraham was, but also what kind of man Eliezer was. So he prays, grant me success today and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I'm standing by the spring and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. <laughs> now, I love that prayer. Do you think God doesn't know he's standing there by the spring and that who's coming out? But he's just kind of reminding God of what's going on. We do that all the time, don't we? God knows what's going on in our lives, but sometimes we have to reiterate it just to show the importance that it has to us. He goes on to say, Now may it be that the girl to whom I say, Please let down your jaw so that I may drink, and who answers me, Drink, and I will water your camels also, may she be the one whom you have appointed to your servant Isaac, and by this I will know that you have shown loving kindness to my master. Again, he wants loving kindness for his master. Now, hospitality was and still is the centerpiece of Middle Eastern culture. It is absolutely normal for a woman to give water to a stranger. So, is this a good prayer? Is this a good fleece to throw out before God to ask for this? Ah, there's the key here in this prayer. It's not just that she will give water to him, because every woman at the well would do that, but that she would also water the camels. Do you know that camels can hold 25 gallons of water? How many camels did he have? That's 250 gallons of water. If she is going to water the camels, she has to get from the well and take to the trough for the camels. 250 gallons. Now, I just think of a gallon of milk, and I don't know that I'd want to carry 250 gallons of milk from the well after getting the water and then over to the trough. So this isn't just your normal prayer. Any woman would give him water, but nobody. It was not culturally the thing to do to offer to water the animals. So this was really a difficult fleece. Not something that one would expect. And when I say a fleece, does everyone understand what that means? If you read the book of Judges, uh, I don't know if it's chapter 5 or 6, Gideon was called a mighty warrior by God when he was anything but. God told him that he was going to defeat the Midianites, and he, didn't, he had no way of doing it. He wasn't even a warrior. So he asked God for a fleece. I mean, what, he asked God to make the fleece, I don't remember exactly, it was wet, wet or dry on one side or the other. And God did that, which was the opposite way that it should have happened. And it, so Gideon was really excited, and then, but then he kind of had doubts. So he off, asked for another fleece from God, and God did that. So because he asked for the fleece to be wet on one side and dry on the other, Whenever we ask God to do something exactly within the way we want it, we call that throwing out a fleece. It's, um, I will tell you that one time, I don't often throw out fleeces, but sometimes you need to. Sometimes our faith needs a little oomph. So one time when my son wanted to switch schools, and I was not in favor of that, I threw out a fleece, and it was a tough one. God, you need to give us someone that we can carpool with. And my son did band, so it had to be somebody who was in the band. They had to live near us. And I, there were one or two other things that I threw out for a fleece. And God answered every single one of them. So we let our son go to that school. He didn't stay very long, but we believe it was what God wanted because God, when you answer every single one of those details that you throw out, you know, you got to obey what God shows you. Anyway, I'm getting off the track here. Uh, where are we? We are turning to verses 15 to 17. 
Before Eliezer had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethulia, the son of Milcal, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out with her jar on her shoulder. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin, and no man had had relations with her. Now, I, I read that, and I think, well, it says she was a virgin. So why does it say no man had had relations with her? It means the same thing. But I guess the point is God wanted us to understand. He gave us two phrases that mean the same thing. And she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly lowered her jar to her hand and gave him a drink. Now when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water. I will draw also for your camels until they have finished drinking. Remember, 25 gallons by the camel, 10 to camels, 250 gallons. That's a lot of water. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran back to the well to draw, and she drew for all his camels. Meanwhile, the man was gazing at her in silence to know whether the Lord had made his journey successful or not. I would imagine if it was me, I'd just be going, are you kidding me, God? You answered it exactly like I prayed. This has to be the woman. And not only that, but she was beautiful and she was a virgin, though he wouldn't have known that right at the same time, nor would he have known the, rel the relations. But he knew that God answered his fleece. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel. Again, one shekel is worth 0.4 ounces. So he took a gold ring and he gave two bracelets for her wrist weighing 10 shekels in gold. So the 10 shekels in gold would be equivalent to $9,148 worth of gold today. That was a lot. Very expensive gifts. And he said in verse 23, Whose daughter are you? The way I understand it is he gave her the ring and the bracelets before he even knew who she was. He was so convinced that this was an answer to prayer. He said, please tell me, is there room for us to lodge in your father's house? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethula, the son of Milcal, whom you, she bore to Nahor. Again, she said to him, we have plenty of both straw and feed and room to lodge in. Again, that's Middle Eastern hospitality, that they would do something like that. They didn't have holiday inns back then, so people needed to help other people. And this was a woman. At a well, she doesn't really have the authority to bring home a stranger, and yet she did. So let's look at the family tree. We've talked about it a little bit, but we have Abraham and Sarah on the left-hand side with their son Isaac, and I only put him there because it's the lineage of the Messiah. On the right-hand side, you had his brother Nahor and his wife Milcal, who is his niece, and they had a son named Methuel, and then Methuel... Methuel had a daughter named Rebecca. So you notice there's a generation that's missed in here. Isaac is much older than Rebecca because you've got three generations on Rebecca's side. You've only got two on Isaac's side. However, Isaac was a product of a very late maternity. Isaac or Abraham was 100 years old when he was born, so he was really more... Isaac was more like a grandson to Abraham, so he and Rebekah really would have been the same age, even though there's a generational difference. Then Eliezer, the servant, bowed low and worshipped the Lord. Every time I see things like that in Scripture, I'm so humbled to think that as soon as God answered prayer, they bowed down and worshipped. They didn't just say, oh, praise the Lord and go on with their day. They bowed down in praise and worship to God when he answered a prayer. I think of the football players. <laughs> you know, they go like this, which is their way of honoring God when there's a touchdown or something good happens. That's, they can't, at that point, get down on their knees and worship God. 
But it is important for us to recognize what he's done for us when he does it. And not just wait, but do it immediately in some form. Here Eliezer fell on his knees, bowed low, and he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abram, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth towards my master. What was his first blessing? It was for his master. That was always his focus. And he says, As for me, the Lord has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brothers. Now, I wondered why, when he made his way to the house of Nahor, or the Chaldees in that area, why didn't he just walk into the city and say, where does Nahor live? <laughs> I mean, it was a big city. that He might not have been able to do that. But if he stayed long enough, somebody would have known who Nahor or Nahor's family was. But he did it a different way, a logical way for that time period, but a different way. And now he's praising God that God guided him in the right way instead of what might be the expedient way. The right way was trusting God, praying, seeing God fulfill the prayer, and knowing that God's hand was in all of this. How encouraged Eliezer must have been. When you share with me the things that God has done in your life, that encourages me. I love to see how God works in people's lives. And here he was experiencing it on his own not just from somebody else. That's even more encouraging when we see God's hand on our lives. When was the last time you saw God's hand on your life? We can only see God's hand in our lives if we're looking for it, if we're asking for him to do the impossible, for Him, his glory. And then we see him do it and then we give him glory. If we haven't seen that in a while, start asking God for the impossible. Relatives who don't know the Lord, uh, friends, sicknesses. Not everybody's going to be healed because everybody will eventually die. But ask God for the impossible and see what he does. And not for your own benefit, because Eliezer wasn't praying for himself. He was praying for his master. And he was praying be not just for his master, but for the fulfillment of the covenant that God made to his master. So it was all for the glory of God. That's a key, folks, in everything we do. It should all be for the glory of God. Then the girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban. And Laban ran outside to the man at the spring. When he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrist, and when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, This is what the man said to me. He went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. Well, I can read a lot into this because I know what, who Laban is down the road, <laughs> and I know what he does. He's kind of a trickster and a scoundrel. So I look at that, and I see that Laban ran out to the spring, not just from the words of his sister, but because he saw these gold bracelets. I mean, that's in the context. That had a great impact on why he went out to the springs, was because of the gold. They probably were not used to that kind of opulence. And he wanted to see what was going on. Now, again, I'm reading into it, because later we're going to find out in Genesis, he does some pretty unscrupulous things. Now, going back to Genesis 24, 31 to 33. And he said, Laban said, Come in, blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside since I have prepared the house and a place for the camels? So the man entered the house. Then Laban unloaded the camels, and he gave strong feed to the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. This is important to realize. Laban is washing their feet. Whose job was it to wash feet? It was a servant. But Laban is doing it. That tells me they might not have a lot of servants. They might not be in the financial position that Abraham is in because Laban is doing the work. Either that or his unscrupulousness wanted control of the gold and the things that he was bringing in. But since that idea of unscrupulousness isn't mentioned here, I'm thinking that they don't 
they don't have the servants to do this. So he's doing it. Also tells us, too, something different here. Eliezer didn't come by himself. He came with a bunch of other guys. Smart move. He would have had, I don't know how many, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of things that he had in those packs. He needed security, and he also needed help in the process of doing what he was doing. Uh, back, going back to um, the top of this in, in verse 31, Laban said, Come, blessed of the Lord. We see several references here to Laban and his family recognizing who the Lord is. So they aren't just pagans living in Ur. It seems like they might have a relationship with God. Now, we don't know that for sure, but it's very possible. If so, that means Abraham had some kind of a relationship with God probably before he left Ur of the Chaldees. Going back to this, um, it tells us in verse 33, but when food was set before him to eat, he said, I will not eat until I have told my business. And Laban said, speak on. I'm so encouraged by the attitude of Eliezer. This was so important to him that he would not sit down and have a home-cooked meal, the best food you could have, instead of the fast food they were eating on the trails, until he'd done his business. I see, to me, I would think, let's sit down and eat and we'll talk business while we're eating. But not him. He had to get his, take care of his business. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master so that he has become rich. And he has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and servants and maids, camels and donkeys. Does he say that Abraham earned it? No. Where did Abraham gain his wealth? The Lord gave it to him. Let's not forget that. If you are wealthy, you may have earned it, but the Lord gave you the ability to earn it. And the reality is everyone in this room is wealthier than 96% of the people in the world. Going on in verse 36, he says, Now Sarah, my husband, my master's wife bore a son to my master in his old age, and he has given him all he has. That pretty well lays out the scenario. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I live. But you shall go to my father's house and to my relatives and take a wife for my son. I said to my master, Suppose the woman does not follow me. He said to me, the Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you to make your journey successful. And you will have a wife for my son from my relatives and from my father's house. There's that trust that we were talking about. He's relating Abraham's faith. Then you will be free from my oath when you come to my relatives. And if they do not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. I didn't, didn't seem to be any question that there was a girl there that was of marrying age that would marry Isaac. Again, trust. Oh, yeah, good, good point. It would be unusual for them to, for Eliezer to call them Abraham and Sarah instead of Abram and Sarai, the names that they were familiar with. So I'm guessing since it's written this way that perhaps he explained the name change or maybe they didn't even question it. As we go on to verses 42 to 44, it reads, So I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will make my journey on which I go successful, behold, I'm standing by the spring, and may it be that the maiden who comes out to draw unto whom I say, Please let me drink a little water from your jar. And she will say to me, You drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman who the Lord has appointed for my master's plan. He continues, Before I had finished speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came, came out with her jar on her shoulder and went down to the spring and drew. And I said to her, let me, Please let me drink. She quickly lowered her jaw from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will water your camels also. So I drank, and she watered the camels also. 
you know, we keep hearing the same story over and over again. Makes you wonder why God reiterated it. But this is such an unusual story, such an unusual fleece for her to water the camels. And here we even have a better idea because it said she went down to the spring to draw. So she didn't just go from here over to the end of the table to get water. She went down and then she went to the spring to get the water and then she had to bring them back up for all those camels. She quickly, lo let's see, um, verse 47. Then I asked her and she said, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, who milk out bore to him. And I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists. Nose rings, that's how they wore them back then. They wear them that way again today. And I bowed low and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had guided me in the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. So now, if you're going to deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, let me know that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. What does he mean, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left? Yeah, that I may go, do a different, go a different way, that I may go on to what's next if you're not going to accept this. Then Laban and Bethuel replied, The matter comes from the Lord, so we cannot speak to you bad or good. Here is Rebecca before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. Ha! Huh. I'm thinking, would I let my daughter go off to some, with some stranger to a strange land just because he says so? Well, in this day and age, the answer is no. But back then, first of all, Eliezer knew a lot of information that no normal person would know. And secondly, God's hand was clearly in this because both the father and the brother say, uh, the matter comes from the Lord. And they both say the Lord has spoken, so they knew. Oh, sure, they would have known that Abraham was a relative because he was Nahor's brother. But how many Abrahams were there? <laughs> you know, there could have been many John Doe's back there and many Abrahams. But they knew that this was the Abraham. Now, I often wonder if they had had communication over the years, over the decades. You didn't have a normal communication back then, but you did have caravans. So you could send communications back and forth from people. And Abraham knew that they were still in that area of Ur of the Chaldees. So perhaps they had had communications so this wasn't as strange as it looks. When Abraham's servants heard these words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. The servant brought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. Why did he bring all this stuff? Why did he give it to Rebecca and to her family? That's what they did. That's a dowry. The man, you might say, purchased the wife with the dowry. In this case, it was excessive, excessive. But that's also a way to prove the story with the excessive amount. A normal person would not pour out those kinds of dowries or excessive giving to just anyone. But her brother and her mother said, let the girl stay with us for a few days, say 10. Afterwards, she may go. <laughs> I'm seeing the later Laban in this statement. Oh, just 10 more days, and then she can go. And in 10 more days, we'll be able to say, well, let's wait another 10 days or 20 days. And but Eliezer was smart. He said to them, do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, we will call the girl and consult her wishes. They never consulted the wishes of the woman. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Thus they sent away their sister Rebecca and her nurse with Abraham's servant and his men. She was willing to go. Interesting again. 
You wonder what's behind the scene that we don't know. Was God working in her life? Was God preparing her? Was she praying for a husband? Was there nobody in their area that met their criteria for a husband and she thought she was going to be an old maid? Why was she so willing to go with a stranger to a foreign land? I can't help but think that God's hand was in that. There's no other explanation for it. Not only to go to a foreign land, but to leave her family in one day. Now that tells me she had a really dysfunctional family. <laughs> Or she was ready and knew that it was time to move on in her life. I would venture to guess the second. Although her son was, her brother was very dysfunctional, I would venture to guess it was the second. Anyway, she went. It says here that she went with her nurse. Now here's the trivia question of the night. What was her nurse's name? Don't feel bad. I didn't know either until I looked it up. I should have known this. It's a very good name. The name means busy bee. It's Deborah. Deborah is her nurse. And we'll see that later in chapter 35, verse 8, when she dies in Bethel. So all she took with her was a nurse. nurse? Kind of like a maid, a maid servant. It was what it would have been rather than a, a nurse for health purposes. But it doesn't say her maid servant, so she might have had health issues and needed somebody to, who knows what she did for her. They blessed Rebecca and said to her, may you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands. Did Rebecca become the mother of thousands and ten thousands? Yes. It's quite a prophecy. And then they say, may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Israel, or the Jews, did possess the gates of those who hate them. So that prophecy actually came to be when they blessed her. Then Rebekah rose with her maids, and they mounted the camels and followed the man. Now here it says she has maids, not just the nurse, but maids. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. Now we know, by the way, why they had 12, 10 camels. <laughs> Now, Isaac had come from going to Bir La Roy, which is a little bit south of Beersheba, which is in the Negev, the desert of Israel, for he was living in the Negev. Isaac went out to meditate in the field towards evening, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, camels were coming. I thought, he's meditating. You know, I just wish God would give us more details. What was he meditating on? Did he know that, the, that Eliezer had gone to find him a wife? And I would say, yes, I don't think Abraham would have kept that from him. He probably knew. Was he wondering what she was going to be like? Was he excited? Was he concerned? Was he praying? But he was by himself out in the field. It says in verse 64, Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. She said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, He is my master. Then she took her veil and covered herself. Why? That was a tradition back then. A man did not see his wife at that time until they consummated their marriage. And the, in, in this case, because they were distanced in, in their relationship. Verse 66, the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah. She became his wife, and he loved her. Thus Isaac was confronted, comforted after his mother's death. As I read that, I'm seeing something that you don't see earlier in the context. What we see is Sarah died. Next thing that happened is Abraham sent Eliezer off to find a wife for Isaac. And now when they get married, when they consummate their marriage, it's in Sarah's tent. Makes me think that he was lonely for his mother. He was lonely for female companionship. And that's why Abraham might have decided it's time to get him a wife. That's why they would have stayed in Sarah's tent, which would have been a very nice tent on its own, apart from Abraham's tent. And they, uh, and then as they developed their relationship. It says here he loved her and he was comforted. He had a woman 
that could now be his since his mother was gone. We don't know that Abraham had any daughters. Scripture doesn't tell us that. So we don't know that there were many women around. This way he would now have his own wife. Don't you find it interesting, the marriage ritual? I mean, they didn't know each other at all. She hides herself, so when he sees her, she, he doesn't even know what she looks like. We'll see that later with Laban involvement and Grant and his uh, son's marriage. But um, we have, they don't see each other, and then they, when they do see each other, they go in and they consummate the marriage. No ceremony, no ritual, no handwritten marriage document. All they did was consummate the marriage, and that meant they were married. That's why oftentimes in Scripture when it talks about concubines, concubines are considered wives because they've consummated their relationship. But they're secondary wives. That's why you also have that in the Muslim religion right now because they follow a lot of those old traditions. So now Isaac and Rebekah are married. It has all worked out just as God planned, just as Abraham planned, and here they are. They not only have consummated the marriage, but they love each other. That's even better. We move to chapter 25 now, and we find out now that Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. Now understand, let me get my notes out here. Abraham was 137 when Sarah died, and now he's taken another wife. He was no spring chicken. And yet, how many children did he have? She bore to him Zimram and Jokshan and Medan and Midian, Ishbak and Sushua. Jokshan became the father of Sheba and Dedan. We see them mentioned in Ezekiel 38. And the sons of Dedan were Ashuram and Letushim and Lemumen. The sons of Midian were Ephah and Epher and Hanak and Abida and Eldah. And all these were the sons of Keturah. Oh, a lot of a lineage right there. It's important, though, always to list the lineage and the parents, the husband and the wife, to make sure that they are not mixed with the lineage of the Messiah, which is Abraham and Sarah. And you can look at the history of some of these people that are mentioned, Midian especially. Midian was an antagonistic nation against Israel who fought Israel at the time of Gideon, who I just mentioned a little while ago. And Midian went up and fought, uh, Gideon went up and fought against the Midianites. Then again, you have Moses who married Sephora, who was a Midianite. So you have a lot of inner relationships there, but they're not always well connected. I would assume she was quite a bit younger. <laughs> For, yes, but that's, as we're seeing, that's normal to marry a younger woman. For her to be able to have that many children, she must have been considerably younger, more than half his age. Now Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, again, that could be considered Keturah or could be other women, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living, sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. These are all the years of Abraham's life that he lived, 175 years. So he lived 62 years after, well, no, after entering, no, he was, he was 100 when Isaac was born. So he lived, um, obviously, more than 75 years after he entered Cana. So he lived almost half of his life in Cana. Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age. Now, when I read that, I thought, how many words or phrases are there in Scripture that we use today? We use ripe old age. That's a biblical term. We use the apple of my eye. That's a biblical term. There's a lot of things in the Scriptures that we use today that are part of our language and our slang. So his ripe old age was 175, we know from the previous verse. He was an old man and satisfied with life, and he was gathered to his people. As I look around the room, we're not 175 years old, but we certainly have age on our side. <laughs> so I look at that, and I wouldn't call you old men or women, but we are senior citizens for the most part. Are you satisfied with your life? If you're not, 
What are you going to do to change that? God wants us to be satisfied with who we are and what he's given us. Abraham was. He lived a life of honor and trust of the Lord. And if we're not satisfied with life, it's time for us to get right with the Lord so we can be satisfied with him and with our lives. It says in verse 9, Then his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, facing Mamre, the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. Now we know historically that Abraham and Sarah are buried there. Isaac and Rebekah are buried there. Jacob and Leah are buried there. But not Jacob's other wife. It's because she died Right outside of Bethlehem, Rachel did. So she is not buried in Hebron. So this today is called the tomb of the patriarchs because it, and the matriarchs. It's not just the men, but it's the women who are buried here. It came about after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac lived in Ber Laharoi. Now Abraham's dead. So I went back and looked at some of the places in Scripture, what it said about him. And in all three of these verses, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, Isaiah 41, 8, and James 2, 23, Abraham was called a friend of God. Now you and I are a friend of Jesus Christ. He is our friend. He's our master. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. But he's also our friend. But in the Old Testament, rarely, do you see someone called a friend of God? As that denotes a very, very close relationship. And yet Abraham was called a friend of God in several places in Scripture. That shows the kind of man that he was. So then we can ask, how do you remember Abraham? These are some of the things that I wrote down. That he was a great man of faith. So much so that in Genesis 15:2. I think it was two, somewhere beginning of Genesis 15, it says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And that phrase is used throughout the Bible and in the, much in the New Testament too. It was Abraham who lived by faith and he's the father of faith. People think he's the father of the Jews so that he is the father of the law and all that other stuff, but he's the father of faith. He was the example of faith for us to believe. And obedient, this man was, he did everything God asked him to do. He trusted God as we've seen tonight, and he was respected by others as we've seen tonight. Those are just a few of the things that we see that tells us why God chose Abraham to be the father of the Jewish nation, of the lineage that would bring about the Messiah who would save us from our sins because he was a man of integrity. We don't always see it. We don't see who Joseph was, Jesus' father. We see very little about him in Scripture. But since God chose him to be the father of Jesus on this earth, he must have been a great man. But we don't see that. We see it about Abraham. So think about that. Meditate that on that this week of what Abraham was like, and do you have those same qualities in your life? They are qualities to be emulated. Now it tells us in Genesis 25, 12 through 15, these are the records of the generation of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names in the order of their birth. Ugh. Neboeth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, and Abdeel, and Mibsam, and Mishma, and Duma, and Masa, Hadat, and Tima, Jeter, Nephish, Kedu, Keduma. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their camps. Twelve princes according to their tribes. Doesn't God have a sense of humor? He gives Ishmael twelve princes, and he gives J Jacob, um, Jacob twelve sons of the twelve tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. And he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt, as one goes towards Assyria. He settled in defiance of all of his relatives. And defiance means 
he fell over against. In other words, he was always struggling with his relatives. We saw that in the prophecy that God gave about him earlier in Genesis, when he gave the prophecy to his mother that he'd be a wild donkey of a man. Well, clearly he was. Now, this is a map of where Ishmael's descendants landed, which is the north part of what we know as Saudi Arabia today. Makes sense because God prophesied to Hagar that he would live east of his brothers. That's Saudi Arabia. Now, interesting here, as we look at the lineage of Ishmael, I was fascinated to hear from Mark Christian when he was doing his Sunday night event that there is no proof and no written document that relates Muhammad to Ishmael. If you go online and you do some research, they will tell you that Ishmael was the father of the Muslims. But there's no proof to that whatsoever. None in Muhammad's life. And Muhammad was the founder of Islam. So it's up to you whether you believe that or not. But they're, the Muslims tried to have us believe that their lineage goes all the way back to Abraham through Ishmael. And yet there's no proof of that whatsoever. We have proof because of all the generations that are mentioned here, all the lineages that are mentioned here, we have proof of the Jewish lineage. We have proof of Ishmael's lineage. But there's no connection there to Muhammad. Going on in verse 25, it says, in chapter 25, verse 19, these are the records of the generation of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethula, the Aramean, Aramean of Pada Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren, and the Lord answered him, and Rebekah conceived. Forty years old when he married, and we're going to see later that it took 20 years before she conceived. But he prayed, and God opened her womb. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is so, why then am I this way? If it is so, if this is the lineage of the Messiah, if I'm to have children, why am I struggling so much? If you've ever had twins or if you've ever had children that just jumped all over in your womb, it can be very uncomfortable. So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the other shall serve the younger. Two children are going to be born to her. She's going to have twins. Well, we're out of time, and we did pretty good to get through almost three chapters tonight of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and their marriages and their deaths and their burials and the importance of the generations. God gave us these generations so that the Jews could follow from the time of Abraham all the way up to the time of the Messiah. So we would know of the pure lineage as God promised for the Messiah. He also gave it to us so we'd know who had authority in what parts of the world, who was given what kinds of lands. We need to have that. And we need this history. Right now we're reading some of the just basically history. But it's not just that. It's the relationships. It's their relationship with God and what God did in their lives as they trusted him. Will you trust God like Abraham did? Would you be a man or a woman of integrity like Abraham was? Will you do things that honor God like Abraham did? He's a man that we can emulate, and I pray that we will. Father, thank you for this history, for all these details, for all these people that you mention, because they are your servants. They are part of your plan. The 12 princes of Ishmael, the 12 tribes of Israel that we'll meet in the near future, they're all part of your plan, God, and I pray. I know that you love them, every one of them, as much as you love each one of us, and I pray that you would bring these people to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Not through Islam or Judaism, because that's not how they find you, but instead 
through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the Messiah that was promised through Abraham. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining Living Word Ministries. Living Word Ministries is a viewer-supported program. Please visit www.livingwordministry.org for more Bible studies and information. And please join us again for Living Word Ministries.